So, hi everybody, my name is Maya. I work for the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center. Um, we're very excited to have um, our second webinar of 2024 today. Um, this is the February webinar. Uh, but before we get things started with the lovely folks from Eaton Peabody, uh, we are just gonna give a couple of announcements from MAIC. So uh, start out, we have uh, a couple of grants that are open to um, farmers. So we have the Farmer to Farmer Exchange Program, which is accepting grants that is for folks who are interested in traveling to another, um, another place to meet other farmers and kind of have a knowledge exchange. Um, we also have the Community Engagement Grant, which is a new grant this year that is also available to farmers, and that is a very exciting opportunity um, that allows people to do aquaculture outreach in their community. Um, and we also have the Business and Economic Research Program. Um, so if you have ideas for aquaculture businesses that you're interested in starting, but you don't necessarily have the space, um, some of uh, the facilities at the Darling Marine Center and the University of Maine Center for Cooperative Aquaculture Research um, are available through some of the business incubation um, programs. Uh, so throughout our webinar today, um, we are going to have five different presenters um, from the Eaton and Peabody attorneys. Um, so we have four attorneys and one consultant. Um, at any point, please put your questions into the question and answer um, chat link at the bottom of your page. As they come up, um, we won't actually ask the questions during the webinar, um, like while they're speaking, but then at the end, we'll have um, 10 to 20 minutes to go through all the questions. So uh, please, please put those in there. Uh, everyone on this call is happy to answer questions and um, Without any other uh, announcements to make, uh, I'd like to welcome the attorneys and consultant from Eaton Peabody, um, and they will get started on talking about aquaculture and um, legal aspects of aquaculture for folks in Maine. So thank you so much. Great, thank you, Maya. Um, and thank you to the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center. Um, uh, my name is Patrick Lyons. I am an attorney uh, of the law firm Eaton Peabody. Uh, we're a full service law firm in the state of Maine with offices in Bangor, Augusta, Ellsworth, and Portland. Um, in addition to attorneys, we have consultants and analysts um, that specialize in various uh, industries and uh, areas within the state of Maine, including aquaculture, um, and a number of paralegals and staff. Um, Eaton Peabody has been involved with the aquaculture industry for decades. Uh, we've represented Cook Aquaculture really since they got into Maine. Um, and since that time, our, much like the industry, our exposure and work with the firm, with the industry has grown. Uh, we represent finfish, uh, oyster growers, mussel growers, kelp, and other seaweed growers, uh, as well as um, organizations that are uh, doing recirculating aquaculture systems on land. Um, so we've brought some of our professionals here today to discuss what we think are key considerations for aquaculturists and aquaculture businesses, really regardless, regardless of the size um, of your organization and how long you've been operating. Um, so I focus on environmental permitting matters. So I, uh, and I'm based out of our Ellsworth office, but practice you know all over the state of Maine, up and down the coast. Um, there's been a lot of attention uh, on aquaculture leases in recent years. Um, organizations uh, that have organized to oppose uh, aquaculture leases have really kind of ha had uh, a big impact in recent years um, attacking aquaculture leases and also trying to upend some of the regulations at the state level. Um, and this has really, this has made the leasing process more contentious. Um, because of that, there's all the more reason for folks that are interested in getting uh, new leases or potentially amendments or other uh, renewals of their leases um, that really need to, to focus in on that. Um, and really in that regard, patience is a virtue um, in all things, but especially in the leasing process. 
Um, it's a slow process and it requires substantial investment of time and sometimes money, um, especially if you have opponents. Best practice is to work collaboratively um, with regulators and be responsive to their questions and requests for information as you're going through the leasing process. Uh, lease applications require attention to detail and completely answering all applicable questions. Um, when you're going through this process, when in doubt, include more information than you might think uh, necessary um, and let the Department of Marine Resources or other regulators tell you that it's not necessary. The leasing process also requires a lot of planning. And um, the it's important to go into the process with a clear idea of the amount and type of acreage you need to achieve your business goals, um, both short-term and long-term. Um, and prior to starting the leasing process, you should gather as much information as possible about existing and prior uses of your proposed lease site and the surrounding area. So really what this means is stakeholder engagement, which is key. Um, even before you start the application process, but especially during the pre-application meetings and scoping sessions, um, you should look to identify the potential opponents to the project and then try to understand their basis for opposition. Um, this means getting, if you can, get their contact information and offer to meet with them. Um, and then be prepared to listen and be flexible with your lease area, um, its size and its configuration uh, to address concerns and potentially remove opposition uh, to the lease process. And sometimes that's easier said than done, um, but it's, it's, it's always worth um, your efforts to try to engage with these folks and see if you can turn an opponent at least into a neutral. But sometimes I've had clients that have successfully turned opponents into supporters. Um, and that's really just through listening and engaging with them and, and understanding their concerns. So while the, the leasing process uh, can be long and a little tortured at times, what, going through it all, and again, at the beginning, it's really important to know the law. Um, the lease review criteria are clear and they're set out in state statute and regulation. Um, that's Title 12 of the Maine Revised Statutes, Section 6072 and its friends around there. And then also Chapter 2 of the DEP's regulations. They set out a clear review criteria for leases, and that's what the Department of Marine Resources cares about. Um, and these are uh, these review criteria include considerations such as navigation, fishing, wildlife habitat, noise, light, and visual impact. Um, and while it's, but what's really important here is it's, you need to remember that the criteria is not that there's no impact whatsoever um, on these issues, on these uses um, in considerations, but it's just that that interference can't be um, unreasonable. So again, you know, getting a lease where you have some right to exclude other uses doesn't necessarily mean that that um, you're impacting the other uses to a degree that um, that it's unreasonable. It just has to be, or you you just have to show that it's not unreasonable. Um, and the best way to do that is to support your application with evidence and testimony. Um, start. You need to start collecting information and evidence as soon as possible. Um, to support that your lease satisfies each review criteria. And the big focuses are usually navigation, fishing, and environmental impacts, such as wildlife habitat, but all criteria are important and must be addressed um, for approval. Um, collecting this evidence includes taking pictures, uh, videos, and documenting um, your observations on the water and from the shore uh, with notes. Um, and then Build, also, it's important to build allies that will testify on your behalf at a hearing um, or at least provide written testimony. Um, specifically, um, you want to work with other users in the area um, that have firsthand knowledge of these issues of the re review criteria, such as fishing and navigation, and have them be prepared to offer their testimony that um, in their opinion, the proposed lease would not unreasonably interfere with these uses. Um, it's also important to focus on relevant information. Don't get sidetracked with arguments about 
property values or anything along those lines. You, you just stick to the criteria that are in the rules and regulations. Um, that's all the de department will care about. And that's all, that's what you should focus on. Um, and the last consideration is work with your Harbor master and the local boards and committees of your municipality under the rules and regulations, the municipalities have a lot of say, um, the DMR puts a lot of weight behind their opinions regarding lease applications. Um, the municipality really is one of the key stakeholders, and um, it's important for you to engage with them early and often to make sure uh, and you can address any concerns they may have about a proposed lease. Um, and, and again, try to turn um, them at least into a neutral, but you know, even better if they can be an ally. So with that, um, the next consideration uh, we'll, we'll raise with you is um, the formation and planning of your aquaculture business. And here this, this afternoon, we have Caitlin Carroll out of our Bangor office. So I'll kick it to Caitlin. Hi, thanks, Patrick. Um, as Patrick said, my name is Caitlin Carroll. I'm uh, based in the Bangor office. I'm in our business practice group. Um, so today I'm going to cover a little bit about the different entities that you may want to form as you're thinking about your aquaculture business. Um, there are four main categories. You have your, um, what I kind of refer to as the default is your sole proprietorship. So if you're just one person running your business, that's going to be your default entity. Um, if you're bringing on more than one person, you might have a partnership. Um, neither the sole proprietorship nor the partnership require any kind of um, filing with the state. So you kind of can even have just a verbal agreement to work with each other to work with your business. Um, as we kind of get a little bit more complex, we have a limited liability company and a corporation. And so those last two are a little bit more um, intensive. You have some filings that you need to comply with, but they offer you some additional benefits if you have um, a, a plan in mind or, or growth um, if you have a family business that you're looking forward to, it has um, kind of built in ways to manage your liability uh, and your assets. Um, so to take it from the beginning, from the sole proprietorship, um, it's simple, unincorporated. You don't need to have any kind of formal documentation. Um, one of the bigger risks is that there's going to be no separation between your business assets and your personal assets. So that'll mean that your liability, so if you um, are sued for any reason, any kind of plaintiff could reach to your personal assets and your business assets. Um, there's kind of no line of, of protection there. Um, and then with uh, your taxes, which is another consideration, all of your business income and losses will be purported, reported on your individual tax return. Um, with a partnership, again, that's kind of a business of two or more people carrying on for profit. Um, usually you'll have a written agreement between the partners that'll kind of delineate the responsibilities and the management between the two. You can have a general partnership where each partner is uh, an equal manager. You're going to be jointly and severally liable for all of the, um, the business functions. You'll have a uh, general control. Um, again, this can be formed by just conduct. If you're acting like a partnership, you'll be viewed as a partnership. There's no uh, filings responsible that you're responsible for, um, for initiating this. Um, you can also have a limited partnership, and that's where you'll have one partner who's a general partner that is uh, responsible for the day-to-day uh, -day management, and then you'll have a more limited partner um, who's a little bit more hands-off, um, and they're a little bit more protected because they'll have more limited liability. Um, and with that comes with less management, so you have less control over the day to day. And then we also have a limited liability partnership where all of the partners will have a limited liability. Um, and with the partnership, you will have joint and several liability, um, depending on your how you're acting, um, so what your conduct is, and then your written agreements as well. Um, and then as with the sole proprietorship for your tax considerations, it'll be a pass through uh, what we call a pass through entity. Um, so instead of filing separate taxes for your partnership, everything is done on your individual tax returns. So it'll be allocated based on your partnership interest. So if you're 50 50, you'll each take 50 percent of the revenue, 50 percent of the losses, and that'll be on your personal tax return as well. Um, once you get to a limited liability company, uh, you have a little bit more structure involved. Um, this is the first one you'll have required filings with the Secretary of State's office. Um, so it's kind of like a, a, a combination between a partnership and a corporation. Um, there are kind of three main requirements. You have to have a single person, uh, a real person, so not a uh, necessarily an entity, but somebody who can who can sign and you want to have your certificate of formation that you'll need to file with the state and that'll have your name um, and the kind of general information about your business. And then you have to have an operating agreement. 
Um, and this could be an oral agreement, but it's best to have something in writing. And then once you have those three pieces, you'll have your limited liability company once it's filed and accepted with the Secretary of State. Um, and so this uh, company will be governed by your, uh, what they call an LLC agreement or an operating agreement. And that'll have um, the different areas of responsibility, the purpose of your business, um, how the membership interests are allocated. Um, this is uh, can either be a single member or multi-member, um, and it can be member managed or manager managed. So when you have a member managed LLC, uh, each member or however you want to structure your membership will have the ability to act as a manager on behalf of the company. Um, they can make decisions, they can enter into agreements. When you have a manager managed company, that manager is going to be responsible for the day-to-day -day operation. Um, usually you will set it up so that the, the members have certain voting rights and, and there are certain restrictions on the manager so they can't you know, sell all of the assets of the company without membership approval. Uh, they, there's uh, certain you know spending limits they can do when they're entering into agreements. So you still have some of that control, but you're kind of handing off the day-to-day -day operations to a manager instead of having to manage it, manage it on your own as a member. Um, generally, members are not personally liable for your debts and obligations of the LLC. Um, they do have a concept, what they call uh, piercing the veil. So if you're um, if you have a, a fishing boat that you're using in your in your business, but then you also take it on, um, you know, fun day trips, you go uh, recreation and you're, you're speeding through the harbor. Um, you're not using that as your your business anymore. So that could be considered your personal assets. You want to be careful with your with your liability and how you're using your assets in the business, because that separation can be um kind of erased with how you use it. Um, and another nice thing about the limited liability company is that for your taxes, you can choose to either uh, be taxed uh, individually, like a pass-through like the uh, partnership or the sole proprietorship. Um, so you'll just allocate your, your revenue and your losses on your individual taxes, or you can have the LLC tax as its own entity, and then you'll also pay your um, your taxes individually as well. So as you get revenue, the company will file its taxes and then any uh, payments that the company makes to you, you file on your own personal taxes. So that's a little bit of double taxation, uh, which is also happens in, in a corporation. But if you would rather only pay taxes once, there's uh, something called an S-Corp election that you can take and that will allow you to be taxed uh, similar to a partnership where you're only paying taxes once on your individual returns. And there are some limitations on that. We'll go into that in just a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, the next in, the organization or the ent next entity is a corporation. Um, and so uh, in the eyes of the law, a corporation is considered a person. Um, so they can be taxed, they can make profit, they can be held le legally liable. Um, and so it's separate from your owners. So the corporation is on its own and you have your owners, your shareholders. Um, so the uh, process to form it is a little bit more complicated. You're going to need to have um, articles in corporation that you file with the state. You're going to need to have bylaws that um, govern how you run the corporation, how you operate your, your business. You'll need to have a shareholder agreement between all of the shareholders to control um, how you can handle your individual shares, what uh, management decisions look like, if you're going to have officers in the company. Um, you have very limited liability for owners, which is a little bit more attractive if you're going to have um, a bigger operation. And as I mentioned, you're going to have uh, double the taxation as well. Um, so your corporation is going to pay taxes on its income, and then your shareholders are going to have to pay taxes on any dividends that are distributed to them. Um, so uh, with the with the structure of the corporation, you'll have shareholders who own the shares of the company. Um, then you'll have directors that are sometimes shareholders, sometimes they're employees, and they're going to run the day to day operations. Or I'm sorry, they're going to run the direction of the company, uh, and they are uh, overseeing the officer the officers of the company who will handle the day to day operations. Um, with the uh, S corp election. If you have a corporation or an LLC um, that have a smaller um, number of shareholders, or it's just a smaller company, so specifically for corporations, you have to be a domestic corporation. You can't have more than a hundred shareholders. All of your shareholders have to be U.S. citizens, and there can only be one class of stock. And so this S corporation election uh, is a tax election. So it goes through the IRS and it just stands for subchapter S corporation. Um, 
And that'll allow you to, instead of paying taxes twice, you can only pay taxes once and only on the money that you receive um, as, as a shareholder. Um, and then I'm gonna ask uh, Jen, who I work with pretty frequently in the business practice group, if she has anything else to cover with uh, organizations. struggle to unmute here. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, yeah, I think that's a helpful overview. And I think the only thing I would add is kind of, you know, a common question we get is, well, which which entity type makes sense for me, right? Um, and so I think that it depends on your growth plan for your company, you know, if you intend to kind of um, create and stay a relatively small business, um, or if you're looking to start a company that has really, you know, high growth potential and um, the ability to scale. And so, um, you know, beginning with the end in mind, as you think about, you know, some of you are, may already have your companies formed or or if it's just an idea and concept, just begin with the end in mind of, you know, setting yourself up correctly from the start can have a lot of advantages, both from a tax perspective and for a liability perspective. So I think it is important to, you know, maybe talk to an accountant or talk to a business advisor or an attorney or something, just to make sure you kind of have all the information to help you determine from the start, which entity type makes the most sense for your business plan. I think that's, that's all I'll add to um, that, Caitlin, thanks. Um, and it kind of dovetails nicely into <clears throat> what I'm here to talk about, which is the financing um, aspect. So my name is Jen Veraletti. I'm an analyst at EP Buddy in the corporate group, um, and I specialize mostly in corporate finance. So I work with a lot of startup companies, um, several of which are aquaculture companies um, that are um, really, you know, high growth companies and scalable. So um, we help assist them with their private equity investments, sometimes strategic transactions, and then uh, hopefully an exit, right? Um, and so today I just kind of wanted to overview the kind of um, high level financing options. The most common are debt financing or equity financing. And again, it kind of, which, which option makes the most sense for your company really does depend on your business model. And so for debt financing um, is, just loans, whether that's from a bank or whether that's from um, friends and family that are willing to loan you money. Uh, and there's some advantages and disadvantages with both debt and equity. So I wanted to cover those quickly. So for debt, the advantages are you're not giving up any control of your company. You're not giving a piece of ownership um, for the money that you're bringing in. And then once it's paid off, you have no kind of further obligation down the line. Um, a related disadvantage is you have to pay it back. And so it doesn't matter if the company's not performing, you're required to pay it back. Um, particularly for bank financings, a lot of times they'll look um, for, it will be a secure secured debt. So they'll look for collateral. Um, and then sometimes personal guarantees too from the owners, depending on the entity structure. Um, and then the terms are subject to, to change as well. So a debt would be just, you know, installment payments. There's a fixed interest rate depending on the market. Um, and then it's typically for a fixed period. Um, that's for a bank. You know, you may have like loans from family and friends that are willing to, um, you know, loan you money at maybe a lower than market interest rate for a longer term um, with kind of better um, repayment terms. But again, the, the disadvantage of, of just straight debt is that it does have to be paid back. Um, and so um, another option is equity financing. So you can, you know, raise money for your company by actually giving a piece of ownership in your company for that money. Um, there's advantages to doing an equity financing, a lot of times it will allow you to get a much higher amount of money, um, depending again on your business model and, and what your kind of growth plan is. Um, maybe this may be less applicable to, again, if it's a, kind of a small business or a family business that you intend to kind of keep small and then just pass um, from generation to generation. Um, Another um, helpful part of equity financing is that, that, you know, it allows you to bring in investors that have specific industry experience, um, specific connections within your industry, um, and that could potentially have a lot of, that could potentially um, provide a lot of strategic value to your company um, and the growth of that. Um, the disadvantages are obviously you're giving up a piece of, a piece of control in your company and then a piece of the ownership and, and the profits of your company going forward. And so, um, there's kind of, as you think about how to find, you know, as you do your business planning and think about how much, how much money you need um, to either to, to just get started or, or to um, get to the next phase. Um, those are the types of things I think are helpful to think about uh, which option would work best for you. Um, and then there's also, of course, the bootstrapping option, right? Of putting your own money into the company and 
whether it's just you or, or with several other people. Um, I think that's another consideration as well. Um, I think that that's really all I had uh, to present on mine. I think, you know, happy to answer any questions. If you have specific questions, again, just depending on um, where you are in your business, um, what your business model looks like and which option would make the most sense for you. So I'll pass it off to Jeff Joyce to talk about uh, IP considerations. Thanks, John. Um, so as Jen said, my name is Jeff Joyce and I'm an intellectual property attorney. Um, for people that are completely unfamiliar with intellectual property, um, intellectual property laws are essentially the subset of laws that help you to protect, monetize, commercialize these sort of intangible parts of your business. So as opposed to your real property and your physical property, um, intellectual property goes to the sort of intangible things. Uh, intellectual property itself is sort of an umbrella term for specific types of intellectual property, which you also refer to as just IP. Um, those There are four different types in particular, trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, and patents. Um, trade secrets are largely what the, what the name implies. It's a secret that you keep and from which you derive monetary value. And there's no particular registration process for it. Um, you need to take reasonable steps to keep things secret. You know, if it should be somewhat compartmentalized depending on the size and structure of your business. Um, and there needs to be essentially a, a legal theory around it so that you can articulate, conceptualize, and demonstrate what it is that you're protecting, why it has monetary value, and um, what you've done to ensure that it stays secure. Uh, so it's a pretty straightforward thing. Um, if it's something that you can keep secret, then you can protect it as a trade secret. Um, there's not a whole lot more to it other than having certain protections in place and being able to articulate that broader strategy around it. Um, the next the next type of IP, which I'm going to kind of brush over quickly because it doesn't typically come into play with your types of industries, um, is a copyright. Most people do know what copyright is. Copyright protects your creative work. Um, so it's commonly your books, your movies, your songs. Um, if you do have advertising materials, uh, that can be protected by copyright. Um, websites all have copyright protection to some extent. Um, it all tends to be fairly narrow. Um, copyright it enables you to stop others from copying your work, as the name implies. Um, but it's it's pretty narrow. People can make one-offs as long as it's not an obvious copy. Um, again, the, I don't typically see copyright come into play too substantially in the aquaculture industry. Um, you, you most likely do have copyright in some works that you've created, um, but often it doesn't directly tie into the real core value of your businesses. The other two types, trademarks and patents, often are and otherwise can be very valuable in the aquaculture industry. Um, everybody has a trademark. Your trademark is your brand name. Um, it can be a logo. It can be the name of your business. If you are selling subsets of different types of aquaculture products, each one can have its own brand name and be protected by a trademark. Um, the, the trademarks can have a lot of value in a lot of different ways. One is that it can be an asset that you can sell later on um, and along the lines of some of the things that Jen was saying. Uh, your trademark also enables you to stop others from using marks that are confusingly similar on related goods and products. So to the extent you've established a valuable brand, you're able to stop others from kind of getting close to that to try to trend on your goodwill. Um, and even if you're not particularly interested in selling at some point in the future, and even if you might not want to go through the hassle and expense of getting into a trademark dispute to push others away, the mere, the mere fact that you've registered your mark should prevent others from registering anything similar and then coming at you, causing you hassle after you've already established a brand. Um, so there, there can be a lot of good reasons to register a trademark from the offensive ability to stop others, the ability to potentially commercialize it further down the road, or simply the mere defensive value of preventing others from getting something similar and then again, causing more hassle and headache for you. Um, trademarks also tend to be really good value um, in legal terms. They don't tend to cost a lot of money to obtain and it is something that you may maintain for as long as you're using the mark. So your, your trademark protection may last as long as you are selling products bearing the mark. 
Um, they they tend to be very good value. The, the sort of things that Patrick were talking about and that Caitlin was talking about as far as establishing and properly licensing your business and everything, those are obviously the first steps that you need to go through in order to be able to do business. But securing your trademark is, is a close second. Um, and it, really, everybody should be doing it. Um, there's really no compelling reason not to do it. And um, again, as you as you grow your business and the products become more well known, people people come to appreciate the products that you provide or the services you provide. That goodwill is embodied in the trademark. Um, so again, yeah, highly highly recommend pursuing that. The other thing that we've done for a number of aquaculture companies, which may or may not be applicable to all of you, um, is patent protection. Patents, as you may know, protect your inventions. Um, not everybody has something that's new and inventive. Sometimes you're just making good products, and that's that's great. Um, but we have seen aquaculture companies that are developing new and innovative equipment to help with the aquaculture process. Um, and when you do that, it, the patent enables you to stop others from making the same thing, selling the same thing, but even using the same thing. So if you do come up with some very new innovative way to make your products, patenting it is one way you can stop your competitors from doing something similar, um, even if it's an internal sort of use and it's not something you might necessarily be selling to others. Um, you can get a competitive advantage by pursuing those patents on your own. Um, the one big thing to remember with patents, which is different from both copyrights and trademarks, is that if you do want to pursue a patent, you need to start the patent process within one year of the invention being publicly disclosed. Um, once you once it's been in the world for more than a year, it just becomes ineligible. Essentially, the, the first rule to obtaining a patent is that the invention be new and the way the patent laws are written. Um, once it's been out there in the world for more than a year, even if you're the inventor, you're the only one to have done it, it is no longer new um, by virtue of the fact that it itself has been in existence for more than a year. So you always keep that in mind. If, if, if you're in the inventive space, you're innovating processes, methods, devices um, that might be used in business, just bear in mind that once it's been out there for a year, it's no longer eligible. So the, these, these decisions on the patent side need to be made as early as, as, as feasibly possible. Um, again, that's in contrast to things like trademarks and copyrights. With a trademark, you can pursue that at any point in time. Um, the only the only caveat is that trademark registrations are given on a first to file basis. So there is still a, an advantage to filing early, but it is still perfectly permissible if you've been selling a product for five years to start the process at that point. Um, the same is true if you did have something on the copyright phase. Um, you actually own the copyright by virtue of the creation. You obtain benefits by registering it with the United States Copyright Office, um, but there's no hard and fast time requirement on that. It's just it's the, the patent process is the one thing where you need to be first to file and you need to be out there. You need to be on file within one year of publicly disclosing the invention. Um, that's it at a high level. Um, more than happy to talk at a more detailed level um, as time permits. But in the meantime, I will turn this over to Jack so you can hear about employment law. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jack Bjorn. I am usually based out of the Portland office, but as you can see, I'm working from home at the moment. Um, I uh, am an attorney in the labor and employment and employee benefits practice groups. Uh, so I'm just going to share a little bit of an overview about uh, various insurance coverage uh, that you or your business um, may wish to look into, uh, employee handbooks, um, some attraction and uh, retention tools uh, to keep your employees happy uh, and with the business for a long period of time. So I'll, I'll begin with the insurance coverage. Um, as you may uh, already be aware, there are several different types of insurance that uh, are specific to uh, aquaculture industries. Uh, the first, uh, I'll, I'll try to kind of weave them together, um, but the, the first is the Longshoremen's and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act. Um, this is a, a version of a, a workers' compensation law um, that provides for the payment of compensation, medical care, and vocational rehab services to employees that are injured uh, on the job 
uh, and where those injuries occur in navigable waters of the U.S. or uh, adjoining areas customarily used in the loading, unloading, and repairing or building of uh, vessels. Um, those benefits provide uh, payments uh, to survivor benefits as well. Um, if the work injury causes or contributes to an employee's death, um, the benefits are typically paid on behalf of the employer as self-insured benefits um, or by a private insurance company. Um, the injuries that can occur that are included in, in such coverage uh, in, include occupational diseases, physical injuries, hearing loss, uh, illnesses arising out of um, the employment. So uh, if you came into contact with certain chemicals or uh, had some sort of reaction to something that you hold from the ocean, um, those uh, types of injuries and illnesses uh, could be covered under this law. Um, the act also covers employees in traditional maritime occupations, um, such as uh, longshore workers, ship repairers, ship builders, ship breakers, um, and harbor construction workers. Uh, importantly, those, those injuries, um, again, must occur in navigable waters or in places such as, you know, the piers or docks, terminals, wharves, those kind of places where these individuals are, are doing business. Um, Non-maritime workers may also be covered if they perform, perform some work on uh, navigable waters. Uh, and there are exceptions, uh, as with any law, there are exceptions to some of these rules. Um, Specifically, again, trying to weave these together a little bit um, as each is separate and distinct from uh, one another. This act excludes seamen or masters and members of any crew uh, or vessel. Um, it also includes uh, employees of the U.S. or state government, um, employees whose injuries were caused solely by their own intoxication, um, and employees uh, whose injuries are due to their own willful intention uh, to cause injury to themselves or others. Uh, notably, there's two years to file a claim for when you first became uh, aware of the relationship between the injury or illness uh, and the uh, impact on your employment. So if over time um, your uh, closeness to some sort of chemical or something in the industry uh, caused you to have a buildup of a reaction and 10 years down the road you discovered that this um, this chemical or something had an impact on your employment relationship, then you would have two years from that period of time to, to file a claim. Separately, but related, uh, is an act called the Jones Act or the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. This act covers the excluded seamen or masters uh, or members and, and crew of any vessel. Um, excuse me, uh, and those individuals uh, are employees that spend 30% or more of their time working on a ship or a fleet of ships uh, and whose duties contribute directly to the ship's functions um, to ac accomplish a, a specific set of tasks. Um, the determination turns solely on the employee's connection to the vessel in, in question, um, and the employee must be doing the ship's work by contributing to that, to that function or the, the ship's ultimate goal. Um, so these could be you know, your, your deckhand type individuals. The third type of insurance coverage uh, that may or may not be applicable is uh, general work, workers' compensation. Um, so uh, of note, uh, in 2020, uh, there was a, a big case at the, the main law court or the, the main state Supreme Court, um, which discussed uh, an aquaculture worker and, and which coverage uh, applied depending on you know, the, the circumstances uh, of this employee's job. Um, and importantly, um, again, as with the other two types of coverage, uh, the, the coverage includes compensation for job-related injuries and illnesses. Um, regardless of fault, uh, the benefits include medical services as, as well as lost wages up to specified limits um, as set by law. Um, and, and workers' comp is the exclusive remedy for these types of uh, related injuries um, that occur when working for an employer. Um, the law applies to almost all public and private employers, um, and failure to obtain coverage uh, can cause the, the business to lose licenses, uh, lose accreditation, lose their um, uh, employment or employer stature um, under uh, state regulations. 
um, and uh, those employers uh, that willingly don't um, in, have this type of uh, workers' compensation can also be subject to large monetary fines um, as well as uh, be guilty of a Class D crime. So uh, big picture from these types of insurance, uh, you do want to make sure that they are in place, um, whether or not they apply to specific employees versus other employees um, is very uh, fact-based, uh, um, the, the totality of circumstances based. Um, and there are also other considerations for, for general uh, business liability insurance, um, which may cover other types of issues unrelated to, um, you know, workers uh, compensation limits. Um, another important consideration that you uh, may want uh, to think about when starting a business or after you've been in business for a, a considerable period of time is an employee handbook. Um, a, a handbook is a great tool um, both for uh, setting out the required laws that uh, apply to your business, um, thinking such things as uh, FMLA, um, whether state or federal based, um, certain harassment and discrimination provisions, uh, things that uh, all businesses in the state, regardless of size, um, are, are required to abide by. Um, there are also great tools um, for just setting the individual employer uh, expectations and, and other policies that may or may not be required under, under state or federal law. Um, so one, one of those important considerations is whether the employee is in fact an employee for, versus uh, an independent contractor and whether that employee is uh, an at-will employee versus uh, a contract employee. So uh, one important thing that we like to include in, in all of our employee handbooks that we do for clients uh, is include an at-will statement just so that every employee that comes to the business understands that uh, the employment relationship is at will, meaning that either the employer or the employee um, can decide to go their separate ways um, for any or no reason. Um, a couple of the other things that uh, are, are helpful to include are policies related to your holiday or PTO or, or vacation or sick pay. Um, one of those uh, types of, of leave that I already mentioned as well is uh, the FMLA or, or state FMLA. Um, those determinations are, are based on your size of your business. So federal uh, FMLA will apply to businesses of, of 50 or more employees generally, um, whereas the state FMLA will apply to businesses of 15 or more employees. Under federal FMLA, um, employees uh, are entitled to, to 12 weeks of uh, unpaid leave um, in any 12 month period and under state FMLA, uh, those employees are uh, allowed up to 10 weeks in any two year period. So these are again, just important considerations uh, depending on the size of the business. Um, again, they, they also go hand in hand with uh, some of these uh, injury related uh, topics as, as well. Um, one other uh, helpful thing about uh, the handbooks um, is including things that are related to more towards company culture. Um, so those are, are other tools that can uh, attract and um, keep the employees with the business. And, and those things can include, you know, employee benefits. Uh, generally speaking, in employee handbooks, we do uh, very uh, summary level descriptions of the employee benefits um, so that employees understand that uh, those benefits are offered um, and they can talk to either the owner of the business, HR, um, some other individual that has uh, more in-depth knowledge of those benefits um, and, and provide those uh, specific benefit terms to the em employees. Um, that are also really helpful and, you know, including your PTO uh, type benefits as well. Um, one thing to note, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself uh, in my notes a little bit, but one thing to note um, is, a, is a recent change under, under Maine law that uh, distinguishes vacation from PTO. Um, so if you have employees that have vacation time uh, under Maine law, if, if and when those uh, employees are, are terminated, including leaving on their own, they're entitled to uh, their vacation pay. But under Maine law, um, PTO is treated differently. So 
uh, they're not necessarily entitled to uh, the remainder of their PTO time uh, or pay out of their remaining PTO time uh, unless that's specifically laid out in, in the employer policies or handbooks. Um, just a couple more quick things um, that I'll just provide a very service level overview of. Um, again, uh, just things to be aware of uh, that are recent changes under Maine law. Um, one is the paid family and medical leave law, um, which is currently in the works and in rulemaking uh, that will apply to employers of 10 or more employees uh, who have uh, uh, employees um, for 120 calendar days in a year. Um, and there's also the main IRA program. So even if you aren't uh, large enough where you want to be uh, providing a uh, employer-centered uh, retirement program, uh, Maine law now um, has provided for this uh, state-run IRA program that even small employers can opt into and employers of uh, five or more employees are required to comply with. So I know I spoke very quickly, but if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to answer those as well. I just was trying to get through all the material. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this has been enlightening on so many levels. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have a couple more of our um, folks added just to the spotlight here so that we can see them and they're going to ask some questions. I'm not muted, right? Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. That was super interesting and a lot of complex topics. Care, uh, you covered them in a, in a nice short amount of time. So that was Great overview. Um, so one question, Jack, since you were just talking, um, do you know of any, uh, or are you aware of any resources for employers on in, on like creating these handbooks that you were talking about um, for farmers? Yes, I mean, we, we um, as Patrick uh, said at the, at the start of the presentation, we, we do typically work with a lot of aquaculture or agricultural uh, clients. Um, we have done handbooks for for many of those. Um, these these handbooks can be uh, personalized to the employer's needs. Um, again, there are certain provisions that we want to make sure that we include as protections for the business. Um, but anything else that the employer has in mind with respect to uh, attracting or retaining those employees, um, we can include as well. Um, those those are something that we we draft in house. Um, if an employer already has a pre-existing handbook um, that they, you know, put together from uh, resources online or uh, from another, you know, individual that they they borrowed handbook policies from, you know, a, a fellow business person, um, we're also happy to review those and make sure that they're compliant with state and federal law. Great, thanks. Uh, and this next question came in during Caitlin's. Uh, part of the presentation, so I'll direct it to her. Um, but of course, I feel like anyone is welcome to jump in. Um, would you recommend different LLCs for each lease or would that just be one for the whole company? I'll tag Patrick in on that because um, there are situations where you would want to have uh, individual LLCs for your individual projects, but um, with all leases, it might be it might be better to have one that's responsible for everything. And then there's opportunity to do business as, um, so you can register different names and you're operating as different names, but you're still under the same one. Um, but I'll let Patrick speak to the advisability of that. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it depends on the circumstance. Um, <clears throat> there could be benefits to having separate LLCs um, associated with each lease. Um, one, and it kind of relates back to Jeff's Joyce's presentation about trademarks and brand. You may have a, your business may, especially if you're doing different species, you may have a, a mussel lease and an oyster lease separate or kelp. And if you're trying to market them separately, you can either have them organized under separate LLCs um, or you can have them under one. Um, it dep It really depends some value in having separate ones if there is any issues of litigation or otherwise um, liabilities are separated so one entity you know your muscle organization and business is kind of sheltered from the any liability your oyster one would have or you know vice versa um one thing to it also 
you, once you get a lease approved, there's a lot of value in that lease and leases can be transferred. And now the rules are these leases, standard leases last for 20 years. Um, so you, it's a real asset for in considering how long it takes in Maine to get a lease and how difficult it can be. There may be some value of having that lease separately held and, and you know, looking down the, the road, um, if you're ever in a position where you would just maybe sell the lease um, to another aquaculture firm or individual. Um, one thing to remember, though, is that the DMR, when you apply for an aquaculture lease, they're going to, and it's a corporation of any any corporate entity, they're going to ask you for all names of all the officers and directors and shareholders because they want to know if those folks have interests in other leases under other names because there's the there's a limitation on how many acres a individual or company can have of, of aquaculture leases in Maine. So they want to make sure that folks aren't kind of sneaking in and getting more in Maine. There's no company in Maine that's even approaching the limits that are under state statute, but it, the, they're, they're going to want to know who the directors and managers and shareholders are for each corporate entity. So they can see what other organizations they're involved with. Um, if any of those individuals have any via, prior violations with the state, especially the marine resources, that's something to be aware of because um, that can uh, complicate your, uh, you know, your, your approval process. So that's a long way of saying it depends, and lawyers are very good at taking long ways to say it depends. Um, but uh, it's certainly a consideration, and if you're at that level. Um, that's a good, that's probably where you're considering different LLCs and different organizations. That's a good time to talk to a lawyer about the pros and cons. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. So I have a question. So, and it might, it might be a silly question, but Jen, when you were talking about, um, debt financing and I was thinking about the LLC. So how does debt financing work with an LLC? Is it the LLC that takes out the loans or is it individuals? And then that's their equity in the LLC. And how does that, how do you delineate all of that messiness? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So it is, if you have an LLC, the entity would take out the loan, whether, you know, from the bank or from the person that you're, um, th from who you're receiving the loan. And so when I mentioned the personal guarantees, it really does depend, right? Because most bank financing, they're going to want to see collateral. And so depending on, you know, what assets you have to provide for that, if there, if there isn't enough to secure the loan, the bank could also require personal guarantees from one or more of those LLC members, right? Uh, depending on their ownership interest and, and who's involved in the day-to-day. And so, you know, even even though the loan is taken kind of at the LLC level, um, you know, you could still see those those underlying members have some personal liability in there. Again, just kind of depending on the size of the loan, how much collateral you have to offer up in other terms. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. I, I have a uh, so for, oh, if I could jump in, sorry. Go, Go ahead, Sydney. It. No, I was just gonna so. Um, for Jeff Joyce, uh, I know he's has worked with a number of aquaculture folks, uh, companies and individuals, and just maybe some examples of things that people have wanted trademarked or protected. If you, you know, I know there's been some like technologies on oyster cages and things of that nature. Is, are there any examples you can think of, Jeff? Sorry to yeah on the on the, the patent side on the patent yeah. side of things that that's exactly right, Patrick. Things like oyster cages. Um, Muscle rafts, um, a lot of people have encountered challenges with bad weather and things of that nature, um, bird attacks and stuff like that. So any any type of mechanical devices that you're creating, that you're inventing to help better grow, better harvest during bad weather events, to help keep away predators, um, all kinds of things like that on the patent side. Basically anything that you're creating to help make a better product or to help harvest it more easily or, or you know, whatever it is you're doing to improve efficiencies and whatnot, those are all those all lend themselves to patentable inventions. Um, the trademark side, it's literally the name that you're putting on any of your products. Um, so oftentimes when we're helping people um, obtain their trademarks, what we're getting is pictures of the, the, the bags of muscles with the with the logo on it. Um, or whatever the logo or name is on your website, um, quite literally any brand name you're putting out there, whether it's a company name or a product name, lends itself well to the trademark process. 
Can I ask one other follow-up question about trademarks? Um, sure. you, said that, you said that they weren't very much to get. How much are we talking, like, if you wanted to register a trademark? It varies a lot depending on which firm you want to go with, but um, a, a basic straightforward application, file, preparing and filing the application is probably somewhere, again, depending on where you go, between $1,000 to $2,000 for a standard straightforward application. Cool. It can get more complex if you have one mark that you use on a wide array of, wide array of products. Sometimes they end up in what the trademark office refers to as different classes of goods. And in that case, the government filing fees will go up. Um, so that becomes more challenging. But if you're talking about, if you're selling mussels, you're selling oysters, um, again, something in the $1,000, $2,000 range is probably what you should expect. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Uh, so, yeah, go for it, Chris. Um, in terms of valuating companies, um, how are you do any of you approaching um, the evaluating in, uh, goodwill intangibles? You can have your ask, you know, you can evaluate from a physical assets or from a, um, uh, you know, EBITDA, you know, evaluation. But how, in terms of the intangibles, how do any of you work, have you worked in that area in terms of set, um, setting values on companies that might be for sale? Sure, I can speak to that one. I, um, I've done, you know, I have some valuation experience and, and I think there's kind of a, a wide variety of valuation methodologies that you can use in a company. So you can use their straight book value. You can use, a you know, a discounted cash flow analysis and, you know, and, and, and go off the company's projections. Um, if they're pre-revenue, that you know, maybe that's that's a um, not as a reliable method to use. And so I think, you know, the way I approach it is, oftentimes um, a combination of one or more methodologies to kind of come up with a range in value that I think is defensible. And, and again, I think you're um, for goodwill and the branding and stuff, some of that, it is just so subjective. And so if you're coming up with evaluation for tax purposes, that could look different than evaluation that you're creating to kind of go out and to investors and say, I think my company's worth $10 million and here's why. And that's based on the kind of growth. Um, and so um, hopefully that's helpful, but I think it's, it's some combination of different methodologies. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I'll just ask one more question uh, before we close wrap things up. Um, but Patrick, you mentioned collecting evidence when you're preparing a lease application, like photographs and kind of other ways to document um, that you're kind of in line with what the application states. Um, would you suggest that that evidence be submitted with the lease application or just accumulated in case it's needed later? Yeah, real quick, I would just provide with the application requests. And oftentimes you don't have to show photographs that, hey, this area doesn't have any lobster buoys in it um, to get the application finalized and processed. It's really for the, you know, following that the department does a site visit and they will kind of collect their, they collect a lot of the evidence for you, but you want to be able to have the historic data um, supporting that there's no unreasonable interference. So I, I would honestly fill out the application, ask the department what they want. And if, um, if you know, it's typically it's subsequent to the application being submitted where you can support the site review. And then if you get to a hearing, you show up at the hearing and then you have, hey, I, here's all the pictures I took. These are such and such dates. This shows, you know, it's not being used for fishing and there's no boats going through here, things of that nature. And then you present that at the hearing, it's part of the record. So be responsive to the application, but be prepared to support each standard in the lease approval with that evidence you've collected, um, depending on when you the department more or less is asking for it. Awesome, thanks for that. Great. Um... Well, that brings us right to uh, one o'clock, which is our ending time. But before we go, just thank you so much to all of you for um, answering these questions and for sharing um, your expertise. It's been really enlightening. We are very appreciative. Um, just a couple notes from MAIC to anyone viewing. We do have a, a webinar next month um, which is insanely already going to be March. Um, I believe it is on March 15th and it will be Antonia 
uh, also known as Tony Small from Fishability. Um, so definitely we hope to see you there um, joining us for that webinar and um, have a great rest of your day. So thanks everybody.